Okay, we are live. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Weston. I'm the Executive Director of Actera Action for a Healthy Planet. We are a Bay Area organization dedicated to local climate solutions. In fact, our mission is bringing people together to create local solutions. And we're here today with a host of amazing co-sponsors for this event, um, which I will share with you in a moment. I also have uh, of course, the guest of honor, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, who I will get to introduce here shortly. Uh, thank you all so much for attending today, for taking time out of your Friday to join us on this very um, timely subject of resiliency and thriving um, and just getting past the point of surviving to the point where we can um, protect our planet and each other in better ways. I wanna walk through our um, co-event sponsors with you just to send a huge thanks to our community. We have San Mateo County Climate Lobby, Silicon Valley North Citizen Climate Lobby, Citizen Environmental Council, the Climate Center, Office of Sustainability County of San Mateo, Sustainable San Mateo County, SF Environment, Grassroots Ecology, Climate Resilient Communities, which all of you know is near and dear to Actera's heart, Post Peninsula Interfaith Climate Action, known as PICA, and the Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. Thank you all so much for spending the time to um, send this event out to your communities, expanding awareness. We have about 300 folks in attendance today, which is a really big deal for us expanding this message in the Bay Area. So thank you all. Doing a quick plug for Actera programs. We have some upcoming events this month that I want to make sure you know about. The first is our Green and Home Solar Rooftops. It's the third in our four part series of greening the home. Please attend next week on the 6th. Learn more about the benefits of residential solar. We're going to have a guest speaker from Sunwork, Mike Balma, speak. Um, they are also a nonprofit organization dedicating to expanding clean and renewable energy sources to communities. Join us on April 14th to hear uh, Julie Zeitlin speak about youth voices in the climate movement. Um, some of you are familiar with her work in the Bay Area already, but I'd love to have you join us and hear the third lecture in our four-part lecture series this spring. Um, she'll be delving into the cross-sectoral climate solutions that youth are involved in. On April 17th, please join us for our EV Financial Incentives Clinic. Of course, learning more about the main financial incentives available to income qualifying Bay Area residents. This is a huge part of the work that Actera does under our Beneficial Electrification Program, uh, our Carl Knapp Go EV Program. 50% of those we serve right now are considered uh, income qualifying, and we want to make sure that we're increasing access for those that need to hear more about rebates. Please join us on the 17th. And then, of course, um, something I'm personally excited about because I get to talk with B the end of the month on April 28th, we're actually going to be doing a very similar conversation follow up to today. So if you have loved today's conversation, please feel free to register for April 28th. It'll be a time of reflection um, with our guest B, and she will be talking about the intersectionality and her insights on how to effectively advance climate justice, which will be a good recap of today's conversation as well. So all registration is free. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming events and of course attend as you can. We would love to have you. Now I get to turn it over to Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. He is the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate and Community Revitalization at National Wildlife Federation. He has done many speaking engagements and I feel very honored that he's spending his time with us today Little Axhera, this engine that could, making sure that we are expanding awareness in our communities and providing opportunities as much as we can for continued conversation, particularly on this subject. His talk today is A New Day from Surviving to Thriving. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and thank you to all my family that I, I saw out there in your sponsors, you know, my CCL family, my climate reality family, of course, my environmental justice family. It's such a blessing to be able to be here with you and just to have a conversation for a few minutes. You know, I don't believe in keynote presentations, all that kind of stuff. The work that I come from, we get together, we chop it up, uh, we figure out how to unpack stuff and, and how do we begin to move forward on solutions. So, and it is an exciting time. Um, I, I'm just amazed after, you know, starting doing social justice work when I was 16 years old and then as a student, 
uh, working on environmental equity. That tells you how long I've been doing it. Um, and that became environmental justice and helping to found the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA and being blessed uh, to be embraced and raised and mentored by many of the civil rights leaders and early environmental justice leaders. So it, it's an amazing moment to see the transformations that have happened and the work that we still need to do. Um, I would be remiss if I did not call out the fact and thank my indigenous brothers and sisters who land that I reside on in this moment, uh, both the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey uh, and the other tribes and nations um, whom are the original founders of this country. Uh, so I wanna thank those brothers and sisters that continue to embrace and lift me up. And I also just wanna take a quick moment um, and you know, there was just an announcement made um, in Washington, D.C., and it's now traveling across the country um, of an unfortunate incident that happened on Capitol Hill. Um, I worked there for a couple of years, and um, we had some uh, Capitol Hill police officers uh, who've been injured and, and some other things that went on. And I'm just uh, going to ask everybody, if you could, uh, in your own way, uh, just to send up positive energy uh, for all uh, who've been dealing with hate across our country, um, whether here in Washington, D.C., or in Boulder, or in Georgia, uh, or a number of other locations across our country, in Minneapolis. Um, we have to figure out a way to come together. We have to figure out a way to eradicate hate. Uh, and we have to find a way to also live up to one of the principles, uh, the first principle of the environmental justice movement of our 17 principles, and that is honoring Mother Earth. I raise that because if we eventually evolve into that, we would solve so many of the problems that we've allowed uh, to develop over uh, a considerable amount of time now. You know, if we actually honored Mother Earth, we would uh, not be still using fossil fuels. We would not be um, dehumanizing uh, many of our brothers and sisters. We would be thinking more critically about how to lift each other up how there's intersectionality in the work that we do, uh, and how if we begin to move forward on honoring all of those things and others, how we can protect our planet, which only makes sense because protecting our planet, we're also protecting ourselves. And in this moment that is filled with possibilities, I'm also reminded of how important policy is. Now, many of you who are watching, you work on policy. You work on policy on the federal level, on the state level, on the county level, on the local level. Uh, you work on policy inside of your respective organizations, uh, your academic institutions, uh, and a number of other entities. And as I often share with folks across the country, you know, policy uh, can be transformative. It can help to uplift folks. It can bring hope back. Uh, and of course, policy can also be destructive. It can actually strip away uh, people's humanity. It can do all these types of things. And we don't have to look too far um, to see how that is actually played out. And I also remind folks, especially those of us who work in the environmental space and the climate space and the food justice space and, and a number of the others, that when we talk about adaptation and resiliency, in this moment, we're looking at some very positive uh, actions and steps of how we can help to transform systems and make those systems uh, healthier and more productive but we also know that adaptation and resiliency in a historical aspect has also had some very challenging situations, especially when you wrap it with policy and then you infuse uh, biases, discrimination, racism into it. And let me just walk you through what I mean by that very quickly. And then it'll also help us to understand how some of these impacts that have happened that so many of us work on to dismantle and unpack. And then it also helps us to then translate into this very positive moment that we find ourselves in. So, you know, policy in relationship to our indigenous brothers and sisters took them away from their traditional lands, take them away from their traditional foods, um, began to a process of dehumanizing them to justify those types of behaviors and actions um, and, and did, um, you know, some other unfortunate things, especially I think about it in this COVID-19 moment where we have a pandemic and that many people have been trying to come together and put in place the various things that were necessary to protect folks across our country and across our planet. But if you look at, uh, in some of the impacts for our indigenous brothers and sisters, you know, there were people who intentionally 
um, you know, uh, infused into their communities, very dangerous diseases, smallpox, uh, yellow fever, all these different types of things that, that played out at that time. And then indigenous brothers and sisters uh, had to begin to adapt uh, and to pull into uh, the mission, some types of survival mechanisms, if you will. Hold on to that for a second, because we can also look at policy and sets of actions that justified going and grabbing Africans from their country, bringing them here to enslave them and do some similar dynamics, giving them the most dangerous and difficult jobs to do, of course, without pay for those of us who focus on economic justice, um, took them away from their traditional foods and their traditional cultures and their language and did a number of other things also, if you follow the history, placing them in the most dangerous locations on plantations and in other situations. Very similar things happen with our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters, Chinese, Amer or Chinese brothers and sisters being brought here, helping to build our infrastructure, our railroads and a number of other things. And then we put in place the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I say all that so that we're thinking about how folks have traditionally had to adapt, how they had to become resilient with the sets of situations that they were being presented with. And we see these dynamics also playing out through history um, and how policy, let me come back to that again because many of us work on policy, how policy played a role in the justification of many of these actions um, and many of these things that we're now unpacking even today in 2021. Now, we also got to call it the fact that policy was used to, to limit the possibilities for women for a long time. And we know that the women's suffrage movement began that long, arduous battle to make sure that women were not only being honored, but that all of their rights and possibilities uh, were coming into the mix. And we follow it you know, up through Jim Crowism, and we see even in today how important it is to understand policy and history when we look at Jim Crowism, and we recently have seen both in Georgia uh, in relationship to trying to take people's vote away, and all the groups that I mentioned before have all had battles in trying to do that. And you're probably asking yourself, well, Mustafa, we're talking about the environment. We're talking about climate. Why are you bringing into this set of conversations the civic process? Why is voting so important? Many of you understand why it's so important, um, but far too many folks outside of probably our conversation may not. You know, when we wanna make sure that we're having the right policies in place, the right statutes in place, the right sets of actions, the right sets of resources, they're tied to our vote. I never tell anybody who to vote for, but I do say vote for somebody who cares about your community and somebody who also cares about the future. And that's why I infuse voting into our conversation because if we allow that to not be one of the elements that we do some work in, I know for different organizations that may not be your primary mission, but it has to be a part of your sets of, of prioritization, your sets of conversations, your sets of education, um, or we're leaving gaps in the process and it makes it that much harder for us to be able to achieve all of the things that we know that we're working towards. And as we move back through, you know, we come up with policy in the civil rights movement and we began to see how policy can begin to shift the conversation, can shift the opportunities that exist in a space. And, and we see all of the various uh, civil rights laws that happened during that time, whether we're talking about voting, we're talking about housing, we're talking about access. And then that moves us up into a moment when we finally begin to galvanize and take a look across our country in the environmental context and saying, you know, we've got some tremendous issues that are happening in relationship to air pollution. I'm not old enough, but many of my mentors and others have shared with me that there were times in our country when people literally, especially in the cities, couldn't see the sun because there was so much pollution in the air, so much smog in the air. Everybody do me a favor, everybody take a deep breath. Just hold on to it for just a second. Now let it out. Because sometimes we forget how incredibly important it is for us to, in our own lives, to be able to have that. And then of course, many of our most vulnerable communities don't have that opportunity. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in, in one second. 
But just going back to that moment in history, which is, which is a transformational moment in the late 60s and the early 70s, you know, as we began with the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and how incredibly important that was. And then the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and a number of other uh, pieces that, that came following that. You know, those were opportunities where policy began to move forward in a very positive direction. Now, it also had some gaps in there. And that's where the environmental injustices uh, start to take place, along with policies that existed inside of many of our larger organizations that many of us work with. Um, and because they did not see value in what was going on in people's lives in black and brown communities, let me call it out so that we're very clear, in African-American communities, in Latinx communities, in indigenous brothers and sisters communities and on their nations and on their lands, in Asian and Pacific Islander communities and in lower wealth white communities, there had to be created a space and a place for folks to be able to address what was happening in their communities uh, and to begin the long journey of helping people to move from surviving to thriving. So we saw that in that moment, some good things were happening, but there still were gaps in the process. And that still plays out today. And let me start off as I dive into the environmental side of this conversation and being very clear with folks. I've been sharing this message for close to 20 years now. You cannot win on climate change if you don't win on environmental justice. I want you to think about that for a second because some, some of us, and I've been working on climate issues for a long time and environmental justice issues even longer, we miss that. And just let me uh, make a connection for you. Imagine, if you will, in the early days when we were starting the environmental movement, if there was fully uh, the honoring, embracing of communities of color, of indigenous brothers and sisters, and of lower wealth white communities, how different our movement would look even in this moment and how much further we would be along. I mean, I'm gonna talk about um, you know, EVs and I'm gonna talk about some of the other really critical uh, elements and actions that will help us to win on the climate crisis. But I just wanna also call out the fact that we had opportunities in the past that we missed, that we made mistakes. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna be anchored to that because we have a brighter future and we do have changes that are happening. But if we went back 40 years and we had began to listen to those voices, those sets of experiences, if we had said, you know what, where are the majority of the fossil fuel facilities located? They're located in communities of color. If we had stood in solidarity as true allies with those communities, we would have never had as many of those as we do. And I say that if we hadn't invested so much money, you know, in the fossil fuel industry, we would be much further along in renewable energy. And yes, the technology and the science um, needed to grow, but we all know that resources help that um, and making sure that we're embracing all the incredible minds that are out there in that space. I hope that makes sense to folks. And the reason that I say that is because in our country, and remember that breath that you just took. We have 100,000 people plus who die each year in our country from air pollution. Think about that, 100,000 people. That's more people dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. We know how important gun violence issues are. We see it every day that we turn on our TVs and sometimes when we open up our windows. We have more people dying from gun violence, I mean from air pollution, excuse me, than are dying from car crashes. And we've all lost somebody or know somebody who's unfortunately been in that situation. In our country, we got 24 million people who are suffering from asthma, 7 million kids. And we know disproportionately that it is African-American children and Latinx children who are the ones who are going to the emergency rooms and the ones who are losing their lives. And we also know that in this COVID-19 moment, numerous studies have shown that when you have pre-existing medical conditions, that it makes you more vulnerable to both infections, hospitalizations, and the loss of life. And we know everyone across our country, um, whether they are living in an urban or a rural context has been touched by COVID-19. But we also know 
that disproportionately it is still folks of color uh, who are dying at higher rates. But, I, you know, but we know that everyone has the possibility of unfortunately having to deal with that situation. That goes back because there are also the studies, all of you now are pretty well versed on this, that have shown that when you live in certain areas with high levels of air pollution, that there are higher levels of COVID-19. Now, with that being said, let's just take a quick journey because as we get to these opportunities, I wanna anchor them in some of the communities that I wanna talk about. So I don't know how many of you have been to Houston, Texas, just raise your hand. I can only see some folks, so some people can get away with not raising your hand, but your neighbor might tell on you. But um, how many folks have been to the ship channel in Houston? So even less hands have went up. So the Manchester community is there. The Manchester community is an incredible, hardworking Latinx community. And also when you go to the Manchester community, as far as the eye can see, you will see petrochemical facilities. And when you go to the Manchester community, and people have heard me talk about this, when you roll down the windows in your car, yeah, some people still got old cars where you got to roll down the window and you take that first breath that we took just a little while ago, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. Imagine living in that situation. That's, and they're dealing with cancer clusters. They're dealing with liver and kidney diseases. They're dealing with breathing difficulties. Again, in this COVID-19 moment, you definitely don't want to have any type of lung diseases because we know how that also creates additional sets of challenges for folks. But for those of us who lean more on the climate side, we also know those greenhouse gases that are being released. And we also know that this community and a number of others that I'll talk about are the ones that are not only dealing with these immediate impacts from pollution, they are also the communities that are dealing with the climate emergencies that we find ourselves in, who get hit time and time again from the hurricanes, who have this incredible amount of flooding that continues to happen. And we also know they have brownfields and Superfund sites. And when these floodwaters come through, it moves that stuff all around. So I share this to say that we are all connected in this set of work that is going on. And when we leave one piece of the equation out, it's extremely difficult for us to get to the place that we need to. And for those of you who are like myself, a science wonk, you all have read what the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment Reports have shared with us in a number of different forms and fashions, which is interesting. You know, they share with us the impacts that are coming and these climactic changes that are gonna happen. They share with us also about pandemics and other types of things in that space. But also there's all this information that this, it doesn't have to be a, a sci-fi movie where there's these terrible things that happen at the end of the process that if we get it together, we can make change happen. If we get it together, we can help communities like um, in Port Arthur, Texas. Many of you probably know Hilton Kelly. He's a Goldman Prize winner. You know, it's the highest award you can get in the spaces that we all operate in. And when you go there, there was a middle-class African-American community, all kinds of jobs were going on, strong culture, all the things that all of us uh, want our communities to be and look like. And then all these facilities began to move in. They began to move in with a number of different dynamics. Of course, people weren't able to fully engage in the civic process. People started to change things around zoning. Um, and of course, we all know that in Southern parts of our country, folks have also had to deal with restrictive covenances. And then across our country, folks have had to deal with redlining for people of color. And now they're also dealing with all these impacts, both you know, the public health impacts and the climate crisis impacts. You go to places like the 48217 in Detroit, when kids look out their windows, they see flaring. They don't see trees. And all of us know that trees and, and other greenery and canopies and all these other types of things are a part of the solutions to the work that we do. Let me ask you guys a quick question. How many folks by a show of hands have had a drink of water or a beverage, or I'm gonna stop there because some of y'all might've had some things we shouldn't talk about. So the majority of us do that. And we also know that in the work that we do around resiliency and many of these applications that we're trying to get in place to keep our water safe, that far too many places across our country just don't have that. 60 million people 
in our country over the last decade have dealt with unsafe drinking water. 60 million people in the wealthiest country on the planet. If 60 million people in our country are dealing with that situation, imagine what's going on in other countries across, um, across the world. And that's why it's so important that we have these green funds and a number of these other uh, financial uh, mechanisms to help others to get up to speed, to get the right things in place, uh, to deal with both the immediacy of the moment that they're dealing with, but also with the climate crises. And once again, just like we can't leave vulnerable communities behind in our country, we can't leave vulnerable people in vulnerable areas and vulnerable communities across our planet um, behind as well. Because once again, if we leave gaps in the process, it's gonna be extremely difficult for us to achieve all of the goals that we know are so critically important to protecting our own lives and our, and our planet. And it's, it's very clear, you know, when we see these flashpoints like Flint, everybody remembers what happened in Flint, Michigan. Um, and, uh, you know, I've held too many babies in my arms when I was in Flint. Um, and it, there's something that really gets you when a child looks in your eyes and puts their arm around your neck and they say, am I going to be okay? And what do you say when you know a child has been poisoned by lead and you know the neurological damage that's done and you know how that plays out far too often? You know, you can't learn at the level unless there's a lot of other things that are brought in, resources that are brought in to help you. And we know how competitive it is in our country and across the planet. Um, and if you don't have an education, then sometimes you have to make other choices that you normally wouldn't make. And I think about that all the time. And I think about that also in this moment when so many positive announcements have been made um, by the president and sets of resources and actions that I'm going to talk about here in a second. But I would be remiss if I didn't call out the fact, and I know many of you agree with this, and some folks may not, that we have far too much pipeline carrying fossil fuels across our country. It's interesting when people really finally know what that actually looks like. We have 2.8 million miles of fossil fuel pipeline in our country. 2.8 million. That's enough to go to the moon and back to the moon and back and on your way again to the moon. Think about that for a second. Now, what if we're able to actually flip that? And instead of pipeline carrying fossil fuels, we're able to use both the skills of those incredible men and women who are putting those types of things together and creating new infrastructure, you know, new sets of opportunities around how energy moves and all these other things that are uh, a part of the new 21st century economy that I'm gonna talk about, that new clean economy, which is so critically important and is in alignment with the work that you all are doing. And I think about all these other sets of challenges that are going on where communities have been for quite a while now, uh, building resiliency and adaptation to the negative things that have been going on. When you look at the folks who are dealing with the certified animal feeding operations, let me say it so that, that uh, everybody gets it, the hog farms and the chicken farms and the turkey farms, and, and they've had to figure out ways of, of being able to deal with the, the stench. They have to deal with the algae blooms that, that come out of it. Um, they deal with all these different situations. So we've got folks who have had to deal with things on the, on the negative side of the equation. And now we've got an opportunity to move that to the positive side of the equation, which is just amazing, amazing, amazing. And I'll just call out a couple of other things real quick as we transition here. You know, we've also got to make sure that we're dealing with the plastic pollution issues that are going on. And of course, you know, that's also tied to that fossil fuel industry. We all know what plastics are made out of. Um, and we know that whether we're talking about our rivers or if we're talking about our lakes, or we're talking about our oceans, there's a huge amount uh, of both large plastics. And then of course, those microplastics that now are actually making it into the blood of, you know, of all types of sea life and making it into ours and a number of others. And we've got a chance. So as we begin to not be so reliant on fossil fuels, we've got a chance to utilize new technologies that replace many of these plastic uh, packaging and other things that are being used 
Um, and we've got a chance to, to actually help to protect wildlife, which is so critically important, you know, because it's been shared with us that we're gonna lose over a million species, a million species over the next couple of decades if we don't get it together. And of course that is on the deforestation side, that is on the agricultural side, and that is on the climate side. Um, so we got a chance to actually get it right. And I'd be also, I just wanna share this with y'all because I'm an outdoors person. It took me a long time to grow this beard. I never thought that I could. So some folks said that, you know, I look like a, uh, you know, a, a little mountain man right now. And you know that 90% of our national parks right now are dealing with significant air pollution and impacts from climate change. So no matter if you care about urban communities or rural communities, there is a reason why we should be making this transition um, to this new clean economy. And there are projects across this country that will blow you away. And there are now for the first time and all the time I've been doing this work, real resources to actually help us to make change. And let me talk a little bit about that. And then I just real quickly wanna run through some of these projects to give you an idea of you know, what some of the future can look like because it's gonna continue to evolve and continue to grow. Uh, and I'm excited about being a part of it and watching some of that happen. So you all know that in the stimulus bill, that $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, that there are a number of different dollars that are in there that folks can utilize. Um, on the environmental justice side, I'll highlight the $100 million that's a part of that, which is interesting because when I was in the Office of Environmental Justice and we were like the lead funder for the country for a number of years, our largest budget was like $7 million and that included paying everybody's salary and, and a bunch of other things. So to have $100 million dedicated to vulnerable communities uh, and those who are doing work um, with them is really, really important. 50 million of that over on the monitoring side, which is important um, because we really need to continue to collect the data and be able to pinpoint where things are going on. And then another $50 million um, for uh, the other types of work that's necessary through the states um, with the partners and others. And then we've got the uh, set of dollars that uh, uh, President Biden just released just a couple of days ago um, which is so transformative, you know, $2.25 trillion in that infrastructure and jobs package. I want you to think about that. All of the things that we've been often talking about being able to do, moving that from theory and moving that from early stage development uh, into large scale sets of opportunities, it is such a blessing. You know, we've got, um, all the traditional things that people often talk about when we talk about like man-made infrastructure, you know, bridges and roads, but we also have an opportunity to get our wastewater treatment uh, facilities back up. You all know, we've got places across our country where the infrastructure is over hundred years old. And then we've also got communities. Let me call this out. I hope people are Googling. You should check out when you have somebody uh, speaking in front of you because they might be just making stuff up. So you really need to check it out. You know, we got communities like um, the Sand Branch community outside of Dallas, Texas, African-American community that has not been hooked up to water um, or sewer um, ever, <laughs> yet asking for it all the time. And the community continues to shrink and shrink and shrink because if you don't have some of those basic things, you can never attract house, you know, new housing. You can't attract uh, investment, all these different types of things. There's an opportunity to address that now. You know, when you go into the Black Belt um, in the South, you've got a huge swath of communities uh, that either have antiquated um, water systems or don't have any at all. People are often dealing with well water. You have uh, someone like Catherine Flowers, who many of you either know or have heard of because she's been in the news recently. She wrote an incredible book called Wasted, um, where you literally have people who've been walking through human waste um, because of the situations that they're dealing with and because water tables are continuing to rise because of what's going on with the climate crisis. If you spent any time on indigenous land, uh, on the reservations, there's a huge set of the population that has never had access and sometimes have to travel huge distances to get to water and then bring it back. So I say all that to say to sort of anchor you in the fact of some of these opportunities that exist there. 
you've got new sets of investments um, that with these dollars that we're talking about right now, where historically black colleges, um, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges, uh, and others are now gonna have dollars to do additional work, do additional research, and to be a part of these training programs that are gonna be so critical. You know, when we talk about EVs, when we talk about charging stations, when we talk about a number of these things, there are going to be the need for folks who can move into the advanced manufacturing uh, aspect of what's going on. And brothers and sisters, I need you, I need your help. Because when we look at the climate economy, we're family, so let's have some real talk. When we look at the climate economy and we look at the workers who are in that space, so we're talking about solar and wind and thermal and tidal and a number of other pieces that when we just look at the workers, we know we're getting a little bit better in a couple of those categories, but there's still huge discrepancies and disparities that are there, right? That's one part. Here's the other part that's so critically important. When we look at the ownership of businesses in that space, African-American, Latinx, indigenous, the numbers almost become microscopic and we cannot have the old fossil fuel paradigm, that old 20th century paradigm, taking that and greening it and then saying, well, but we're just, we're protecting the planet. We've got to make sure that this new paradigm leaves the, 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 the negative parts of the past behind and builds upon this bright future that we have. And we've got some real opportunities there. Let me share this with you all real quickly. I love, I love real talk and I love real stories. So many folks know me, you know that I was raised in Appalachia and I lived in Michigan. Those are two main places when I was growing up. We all know that the, uh, that the coal industry has been shrinking for decades and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And of course, some folks will create this false narrative and say that it was because of, you know, President Obama and some of his stuff or something. Don't believe that. I know none of y'all believe that. It, 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 was, it, was, it was gone anyway. So you have really good folks who work great with their minds and their hands, who worked in some of the industries that were there that are no longer there, who worked in the coal mines, you know, because it was only a certain set of opportunities to make, you know, a decent living. So when I come home, when I leave Washington, D.C., and I drive back home, so when I get to Western Maryland, Right before you go into West Virginia, if you guys ever do this, take a look. You'll look up on the mountainside and you'll see all of these giant windmills for as far as the eye can see along the horizon on the Maryland side. You go another half a mile because there's a big gap that's right there. And there's the same set of mountains that's on the West Virginia side, but there's no windmills that are there. So when I went home one time, there was a meeting that was going on and I usually just slide into the back and listen to people who talk about the need for economic opportunities. And I posed this question uh, to the brothers and sisters in West Virginia. I said, are the people in Maryland better than you? And everybody turned around and looked at me and they're like, oh, that's Mustafa. And I said, well, the reason I asked is because when I'm driving back home to go see my mom and I look up and there's all these incredible windmills that are creating energy and that somebody created all those parts. And there's hundreds of parts that are a part of that. And I said, that's why I wonder if they're better than you because we don't have that over here. And I've seen those eight plants that are shut down and imagine if the blades were created there and the turbine was created there and this was created there. And you had a chance to actually make sure that you had a, a sustainable job that made sure that your children, your grandchildren were okay, that you would be able to actually um, not just put food on the table, but be able to send those to college who are interested in a number of other things. And of course, then people are like, well, wait a minute, that's not the way anybody's ever explained that before. You know, many times those uh, folks who unintentionally talked about folks who worked in the fossil fuel industry uh, in a very dehumanizing way, not realizing that they were just trying to, you know, survive and take care of their families. And, and nobody ever have a conversation with them in the sense that there's a space and a place for you 
in this new clean economy. And it is a place where you can be honored, uh, where you can do incredible work, and you can help to protect the future, protect our planet, um, and, and create a little bit of wealth also for your community. That's a different model. And that is the way that we have to begin these sets of conversations about all of these various pieces that are a part of this new clean economy. Where are the EVs going to be done? Where are these new sets of buses going to be created? And all of the pieces and platforms and things that are going to be a part of that. And then the question becomes, in our decision making, where are we going to place these EVs? Whose communities are going to receive them? And what are the necessary components to make sure that that takes place? As we start to have conversations about um, you know, regenerative food economies, um, who and how are we going to make sure that that becomes real? We had at the beginning of this century, not this century, the last century, you know, we had uh, huge amounts, a million black farmers. And now that number has shrunk exponentially in the wrong direction. And how will they be honored in the work that they're doing? Now, we recently saw that there was a, 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 some money that was passed on to black farmers. But we've also got to get folks thinking about these various crops um, and, and how we can make sure that they're being supported. And why, why should we have that conversation? Well, Lauren and others, let's think about this. The numbers vary slightly depending on which analysis you look at, but we have been subsidizing fossil fuels for decades. So as folks are moving and expanding our agricultural sets of opportunities, we should be making sure that we're helping them to have a strong foundation underneath of them so that they can be successful. And once they've got that foundation, they'll be fine. They'll know how to move forward because we will then have an economy that is supportive of them because we have a comprehensive economy that everything is connected and we're making sure that, that everyone has an opportunity to be uplifted. We've got some opportunities also uh, around the CCC program that is coming. And that is an incredible opportunity for those of us who work on natural infrastructure issues, if we do it right. Not only are we making sure that uh, young people of color and others are having an opportunity um, to, to get some strong economic foundation underneath of them, but we also are rebuilding so many aspects that are so incredibly critical. I think about communities like Princeville in North Carolina. This is a community that was founded by freed slaves. It's labeled as a freedman community for those of you who may not be familiar with that term. They've been hit by these major floods and, and hurricanes back to back. And we also understand that all the work that I did in Louisiana, you know, how we've allowed, you know, so much of our shoreline um, and our wetlands and other things to be degraded over time because of many of these actions that were happening by the fossil fuel industry and development and others that we could have minimized many of these major catastrophic things that happened if we had been investing in natural infrastructure. I saw a study the other day that talked about uh, the impacts that happened from Hurricane Katrina. And if we had made the proper investments that we could have minimized by like 70% the lives and property that was lost during that. And that's just one example. So then I start thinking about the CCC program and all the incredible folks who will move through that. Um, and, and then uh, how this can play such, a, such an amazing role. So I say all that to say that we finally got resources in place to meet up with the sets of expectations that so many of us have had for years and years and years. And just real quickly, let me give you a couple of just amazing things that are going on. For those of you, please Google the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The Regenesis Project is led by Harold Mitchell. Um, they got a $20,000 grant uh, a number of years ago, and they've now leveraged it into almost $300 million in changes. And I just want to run through just a few of the things for you all to give you an idea of how these comprehensive or, or intersectionality uh, sorts of opportunities can play out. So they had many of the challenges that communities across our country have. You know, they had uh, lack of access to healthcare. They had 
uh, unhealthy housing. They had brownfields and Superfund sites. They had food desert issues. And we know we got 24 million people who are living in food deserts right now. Um, they had uh, terrible transportation things, even as a smaller area that they were dealing with because they had a train track that separated their community from the other community and the train would come and idle. And they had a chemical plant. And if there was an explosion or when there was a release, they used to tell the people to go in their houses, close their doors, shut their windows. And when it's 110 degrees in South Carolina, that's not really a very comfortable situation. I'm just gonna fast forward real quickly for you all. Before our seniors had to travel about a half an hour to get to healthcare. They now have five healthcare centers and one mobile healthcare unit that travels out uh, to folks whom, who don't have access to transportation. And it's important because they also created one of the healthcare uh, centers that uh, caters to the migrant farm worker population there because they were so scared um, and rightly so uh, to sometimes seek out medical uh, treatment you know, in places where there could be some challenges for them. They got 500 new green homes in this community. And that's important because before folks were living in old, what they label as shotgun housing. For those of you who ever spent any time in the country or the South, that means you open up the front door, you can see out the back door, there's no energy efficiency, those different types of things. People were paying three to $400 a month for their electricity costs. Now they're paying $67 a month for their electricity costs, which is important. And they cleaned up the 35 acre brownfield site and they're putting a solar farm there, which will zero out people's electricity costs. And they put worker training programs in place. And remember in this last bill that came out, training programs, there's funding for that. Um, many of the things that they're rebuilding in the community um, are being done by local residents who went through the training programs themselves. They're now putting in an aquaponics center they're putting in a revitalizing vulnerable communities institute and a number of other uh, really positive aspects. And they got people engaged in the civic process. They realized that if they didn't have someone on the county commission, uh, on the city council, that they were missing those conversations that often happen behind closed doors. They made that happen. Then eventually they got Harold Mitchell into the state house and he along with Reverend Pickney, you all will remember Reverend Pickney's name because he was one of the individuals who unfortunately um, was uh, assassinated when Dylan Roof uh, went into uh, the church in South Carolina. They got the first solar bill passed in South Carolina. South Carolina <laughs> solar bill, think about that in all the states uh, across our country who do not yet have uh, you know, the solar legislation in place. So it can get done anywhere and this is a community driven project. So I know I was uh, raised in a family of Baptists and Pentecostal ministers, so Lauren and others know I can talk about these issues for a while. This is an amazing time. I'm looking forward uh, to the, our question and answer uh, section that we're gonna do, and I'll leave y'all with this. Dr. King once shared with us that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. In relationship to the climate crisis, we are all in the same boat. We all know that there are disparities and other, some folks are hit first and worse, but in the ultimate analysis, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat in relationship to COVID-19 uh, and the impacts that are going on. And we're all in the same boat when it comes to racial justice issues, um, because the ripples that come from that affect everyone, even when sometimes you think you may be immune to it, you are not. I'm Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. I wanna thank y'all for a couple of minutes of your time and thank you for the incredible work that you continue to do each and every day um, to not only protect our planet, but to uplift our most vulnerable communities. Thank you so, so much for your time and your insight. We have some wonderful questions in the Q&A. We will try and get through as many of them as we can. I will. Um, try to go in order just to catch the ones that came in early. All of them are so pertinent to the conversation around policy and what local action we can take. The first is from Matt. He says, thank you, Mustafa. Can you speak to the importance of local EJ policy action by citizens who come from all walks of life? Well, the first place we start with that is making sure that we are authentically partnering with frontline organizations, those EJ organizations and others um, who have to play a critical role in the policy development, both on the local level and, and all the way up the chain. 
Um, so we got to spend time with each other um, and, and we've got to figure out what the commonalities are. And then we got to get really focused in a couple of areas. You guys heard me talk about civic process. So we should be focusing on getting folks elected um, who you know, care about the sets of issues that we're raising. Um, and we've also got to do incubators um, to, to help people to get the skills that are necessary um, to be able to navigate that and the funding that's necessary to help them to be able to get across the finish line. We've got to also, once we get that piece in place, or if we're not getting that piece in place, as you all know, we also have to get engaged um, with our city councils um, and our county commissions, depending on where you might live, um, and, and really making sure that we're showing up. And I know how, how incredibly hard that is because folks are tired. And we've also got to realize that everybody doesn't get paid to do this work. So we've got to be mindful of that. Um, and we've got to honor that. And we've got to put in place things that may help folks who are not getting paid to do this work so that they can be as engaged um, as is possible for them. Um, the other things that we can do is that we've got to also begin to move into spaces and places that we don't traditionally um, think of. So folks used to tease me because, you know, I'm an engagement person. Um, and I used to look for opportunities to help people to get the information that they needed and then to translate it uh, into the gifts that God has blessed them with. So I would go to barbershops and beauty salons. Now y'all know I ain't been to a barbershop in a while, but I would go and spend time there because I knew that those folks had a captive audience. It's almost like when, some, when, we, use, uh, when we work with faith-based institutions, um, we know that there is a constituency that's a part of that. Well, in those beauty salons and barbershops, there's a constituency also. And you, you know, folks can do all kinds of incredible things to help to get people educated and engaged um, in these sets of opportunities and actions that are so necessary. Um, so that is another piece of how we begin to pull together on a local level. And then we've got to think critically also, because sometimes we will get siloed um, in the vision. Um, and sometimes the vision is just about A, um, and that's all there is, and there's not enough on-ramps for other people to come in. And that's why I talk about sort of comprehensive strategies so that if something becomes a roadblock for one thing, so let's say we're trying to get, um, you know, get a, do something with a permit, um, that is only probably going to resonate with a certain amount of people. But if we're also talking about opportunities around housing and transportation and job creation and food security and whatever else that are a part of a broader vision, then you can create a bunch of different on-ramps. Um, and those on-ramps are gonna be necessary um, because you may not get traction on one side and you gotta get wins for folks. We are unfortunately in the society that we're raised in, you know, that folks need that stimulation that comes from from, from seeing some positive steps. Um, and so that's another part I think of most local strategies have to be more comprehensive. Um, and now there are some resources that are out there that will be able to help people to get your arms around that, that type of thing. Great, thank you. The next question has been upvoted. Uh, it's from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the nature of policy, as you said, this means through which historically and presently folks have been harmed. Yep. Do you think it is possible to use policy to undo these harms? Or do you think we need to reimagine and think more creatively about the tools that can really liberate communities and the planet? Policy is only one part of it, but policy is critically important because that policy is utilizing your tax dollars. So there, there, there needs to be accountability in that. Um, and if we don't address policy uh, and call out the fact that systemic racism has integrated into policy, um, and then by knowing that and putting a spotlight on it, being able to think creatively and innovatively um, about what's necessary to, to be able to minimize that or hopefully eliminate it. That's one part. The other part has to be creativity, has to be uh, ingenuity um, because we have a large set of challenges in front of us, but we have an even larger set of opportunities um, so, and that's why it's going to take, you know, a number of great minds and those great minds 
will not only come out of academic institutions. I share with folks all across the country. They know these people probably almost better than they know, uh, you know, definitely better than they know me. I talk about Mrs. Ramirez and Mr. Johnson and the, and, and the immense amount of information that they have through lived experience. Um, and even though they don't have PhDs after their names, they know more than some of the top scientists that I've worked with. They know more than some of the, you know, attorneys and other people that we all engage with. And that's not to take anything away from those folks. Everybody has to be a part of it, but we've got to honor that. And for me, that's a part of that creativity and ingenuity and innovation that everybody brings. But we've got to create the space for that, right? Um, and sometimes we're so busy in trying to get to whatever our five, seven, 10 priorities are that our organizations have said and what that grant says that you have to be able to do to live up to that. Um, we've got to change that model too. That's a whole nother conversation I would love to have with folks around our philanthropic world and, um, and the evolution that is happening but the evolution that has to happen even at a faster rate. Um, so thank you for that question because it is not an either or, it is both. It's a beautiful answer. So, oh, now upvoting is happening. So things are moving around here. So the next question is from, from Alma at Climate Reality Project Bay Area Chapter. Yeah. She says, hello, Mustafa. For those of us seeking to engage locally, could you share some examples of where communities have figured out to reduce and end emissions while also addressing the health and pollution issues disproportionately impacting BIPOC communities? Bring some of the gaps between mostly white climate organizations and BIPOC-led environmental justice efforts? Well, first of all, we gotta, we've got to get both sets of those organiz organizations together. If you're not, you're working from a 20th century paradigm. It's just that, it's just that simple. And you are also positioning yourself to become irrelevant in the work that's going on. I don't mean that to offend anyone, but if our organizations are not evolving with a set of evolving problems and opportunities, those who do will be the ones that folks go to, um, you know, for the answers uh, and for the sets of actions. Now, with that being said, I mean, um, projects like the one I mentioned, the Regenesis Project, they, the amazing thing about that, and I want folks to pay attention to it, is that they had an adversarial relationship uh, with the industry that was there. Um, and there was a couple of polluting industries that were there. And there was, you know, sometimes there is a lack of transparency. So folks don't really know what's going on in the plant. Folks are making some assumptions about what, what's going on. Folks are not privy to the data um, that, that, that is being generated. Um, and you have to change that dynamic. And you also have to build trust because trust has been broken with communities time and time and time again. Um, it's almost like any relationship. There has to be active communication. There has to be respect. Um, there has to be, um, you know, trust. And, and that takes some work. So there at that Regenesis project, they knew that that needed to be done. Um, and over a number of years now, the businesses and, and the industry that's there is, is one of the best partners. They've developed 144 partners in that particular project. And they've got them to take on new technologies um, to be able to lower the uh, emissions that were going on. One of the plants eventually felt that they no longer needed to be there. And they're actually still, the ownership is now working uh, with the project to provide land for some of these new sets of opportunities that the community is moving forward on. Um, so it takes time. And it, it just means that you kind of got to get in there um, and, and kind of break some of this stuff down. Um, I've seen other communities that have had some success you know, folks over in the 48217 um, have gotten some success. Uh, Hilton down in um, uh, Port Arthur, Texas has got a couple of the plants, but the problem is that you have cumulative impacts that are going on in many of our communities because there are multiple, multiple polluting sources that are going on. So when you're able to make some progress with one or two, you still, some instances got 10 or 15 others um, and that's why on the federal level and the state level, one of the ways that we help communities on the local level is in making sure that we're beginning to get these cumulative impact uh, laws in place. 
uh, or sets of, uh, of statutes or whatever it might be so that folks don't have such a heavy load in trying to fight on multiple fronts um, against sometimes, you know, these, these uh, very large industries and sometimes these conglomerates and others. Um, so it is the hard work that happens on the local level, but the feds and the states have to give some help also um, so that you don't have to fight on so many different fronts. Yeah, and that fight continues, I think, for all of us and for your work, too. I know that we are at time, which is the most depressing thing in the world to say today. Um, uh, so what I would like to do is there's amazing questions still in the queue. I would like to send those to you and just get your thoughts so I can maybe ship some answers out via narrative text to folks um, who have been so participatory today. And then also open invitation for us to find another opportunity for you to come back and speak to our audience, um, maybe at some point in person so that we can engage together on a human level, which would be a beautiful, beautiful thing. I cannot thank you enough for your time today, um, for joining us in community and for everyone who attended and all of our sponsors today. Please continue to join Actera in our upcoming events this month. Visit our website, actera.org. And then please keep an eye on what Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is up to and how he's helping us save the planet for his communities and our communities, um, because we are all one. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you everyone for attending.